Hello and welcome. Uh, here we are in a lecture 11. We're going to continue where we've been covering the last time, uh, talking about how to use functional programming to uh, make our hardware designs uh, more generatable, more parameterizable, etc. So we started this topic on Monday. We're going to keep going. So uh, in particular, we're going to kind of change gears. Remember on Monday, it was we were really excited about uh, you know applying a function to every element in the collection, something like map or for each. Today, we're going to talk more about how do we collapse things? What happens when we have a collection of things, we want to reduce that down to something. So the operations involved that are called reduce and fold. We're going to take a little bit of a detour and talk a little bit about extra Scala syntax, just so we look up information uh, in the API. It won't be quite so confusing, kind of give a little brief primer on some of that syntax. We'll also talk about this other operation called zip with, zip with index, which we'll find very handy. And then uh, we'll use that to actually go back to some of the designs we've been doing the last few weeks in lecture and show we can kind of tidy up a little bit of functional programming. And after all of that, we're not even going to give you an ammunition about perhaps when to use this feature judiciously because if abused, I would argue it makes the code less readable, which is not our goal, of course. So let's let's jump right into it. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, load in our notebooks. Great. Um, and then, okay, so as I said at the very beginning, right, we've been talking a lot about so far about map and for each, right, where we can do something to every element, uh, also zip, you know, we took one collection and then we paired up with another element, element for another collection, right? So the result was we have some collection coming in and we have an output collection that's the exact same size, right? It's one to one. For each is not gonna return anything, but it still is doing one function per element, right? And so as I said, what if we wanted to handle collapsing them somehow? What do we mean by collapse? Uh, let's let's see that, right? So uh, one of those things is called reduce, right? And you may have already heard this term, perhaps maybe in a prior CS course, you were exposed to the notion of MapReduce is a parallel programming paradigm. Um, this is very similar to that. Uh, I think the key distinction is that when you hear about MapReduce as a parallel programming uh, abstraction, there's actually a step between MapReduce and the parallel case they don't describe, which is the map really shuffle reduce. And that is very much based on keys. But that's not quite the case here. It's actually specialization is kind of abu a abusive terminology. This use of reduce is a much more classic pure use of reduce. And what simply is, uh, given elements, it applies a binary operator until we get uh, a reduced number of things, right? And so in this case, we have, uh, you know, a sequence of arbitrary numbers and we apply the reduce operator and we're using that placeholder syntax, right? So we're just saying, take first argument, add it, and take second argument and add them together, right? So as you can see here in this little example, we run it. Uh, okay, well, yeah, we can simply add up all those numbers in this list. That's easy. Uh, but we also can do things like, well, what if we want to use map to square the numbers first? Sure. And then we have, you know, our squares, right? And then we can sum them up with that reduce, right? And uh, as you can see, this functional program, there's a lot of different ways to express things in Scala. And it's kind of a question for us to figure out what's the way that's most clear. For example, I could be, you know, more verbose and change a lot of things, make this very, very verbose and say, okay, well, I'm taking in a function of two arguments and I'm going to return the sum, right? So that's uh, gonna do the exact same thing. Uh, you know, it's not just about the space and the period, it's also about, you know, uh, in this case where the operation is hopefully pretty clear with the placeholders, maybe it's, it really is more clear to the placeholders, not just shorter. For example, in this later line, here we did it all as, you know, two lines. We kind of see what's going on. First, we make the squares and we just sum of squares. You know, perhaps someone might argue, well, gee, I think it's maybe more clear to me if you did it all at uh, once, right? Which is totally valid. But is that more clear? I don't know, right? Uh, I think there's a little bit of room for uh, discussion uh, on this one. I would argue perhaps maybe this one, at least the name on it, makes it very clear what the purpose is, right? And that really kind of helps make it more readable. Now, if we um, look at this map, you're saying, hmm, why didn't I use the placeholder syntax here? Well, uh, the reason why I couldn't is I'm actually, well, I want to use this argument more than once, right? I want to use it I times I, right? So if I did this as, you know, like the placeholder style we just saw, I'm gonna go ahead and cut this, I can use it again. Uh, what's gonna happen, it's gonna yell at me, right? Because the first time I use a placeholder, right? It binds to the first argument. So I use a placeholder again, it's gonna be bound to the second argument. In this case, there's only one argument, right? So what's it binding to? Um, that's why, of course, the compiler is unhappy with me. 
Uh, and so sometimes, you know, you need this. Now, we could call, you know, uh, some sort of exponent function um, to try to maybe use only one invocation and it'll be fine. But, you know, sometimes it's not so bad really just to be more explicit and have the whole thing written out. Okay, I see a question coming from chat. I'm not sure I understand about uh, using a underscore of a asterisk. Uh, maybe that student can go ahead and clarify. Oh, the question is, could we combine these in an interesting way? That's an interesting idea. I didn't think of trying that. This is probably not going to work because it's not going to know. The question is, what if we did this, right? Um, so the placeholders, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be happy because we've already bound the variables. So we'll see what happens here. Yeah, see. <laughs> oh, sorry. In this case, we're doubly defining. Uh, this, this is the kind of area you're typically going to see when placeholding goes wrong. So uh, there will be some times where you are using placeholders which you think is a perfectly valid scenario. And the compiler doesn't tell you it can't do it. And part of what it has to do is it has to be able to resolve and f figure out the types, right? So, for example, we're using an operation like map. You know, it's able to perhaps, you know, infer the type of this operation uh, based on uh, this collections type. And from there, you can kind of make progress. But at times, the compiler, uh, sorry, this, you know, Scala type inference engine inside the compiler is going to throw up his hands and say, I can't help you. You know, I can't figure this out. In which case, it's going to ask to be a little more explicit. And you might wonder, well, wait a second. This thing up here, I didn't say any types, right? I didn't actually have to say, you know, this is an int. That's going to, you know, work just fine. But I mean, I didn't need to say it was an int. I was able to figure it out. Uh, but in terms of what the error message looks like to humans, uh, I believe these are kind of mapping to the same error message. But so in this case, like I said, we have a placeholder. You shouldn't mix the placeholders with, uh, you know, name variables, right? Sorry, with bound variables, right? Here you are, you know, binding these variables. And so uh, typically if you have the, the placeholders, you're not going to have any bound variables or the arrow. And sometimes they said the placeholder is a very natural way to kind of very concisely express what you want. Especially in Chisel, you're going to see us very often use the placeholders to, you know, given something, say, hey, you know, dot, you know, io, dot valid or something, right? Because that's a very common thing where I kind of want to just go in and grab something, right? Um, but, you know, sometimes it's not easy, easy or possible to use a placeholder, in which case we're not going to, right? Uh, but I just kind of want to show you this kind of thing where we're using these functionalities. I want you to try to be a little brave about trying to learn how to use them, but then also recognize that you can go too far with these techniques and end up making code that's, sure, maybe you may glorify how dense it is, but our, our net goal is not density. Our goal is readability, right? Our number one is correctness. Number two is readability. And sometimes things are more readable for a little bit longer, a little bit more explicit, a little bit less dense. Uh, density is only a virtue if that makes it shorter and easier to read, right? Um, cool. Great questions. Let's keep them coming. Okay, let's let's go on then. Um, so... If you remember from a prior lecture, we built our own arbiter, even though there's some built into Chisel, just kind of as an example to try things out. And uh, we went over this at the end of the last lecture. I want to do it again to make sure we're kind of seeing all the points. So remember, we built our own arbiter, which essentially was a priority encoder, which was we're using to actually determine who wins. And then there's just lots of connecting work we need to do in Chisel, right? We need to kind of connect all these things up. We need to have, we have the coupled ports coming in for all the inputs. We have the coupled port for any for the output. So you kind of need to kind of connect all these things up. So they had a for loop here, quite a bit of work, and then quite a bit of hoop jumping, right? And then, you know, okay, this, this worked from before. And then if you remember at the end of last time, we tidied this up, right? We said, hey, uh, what if we throw some functional programming at this, right? So in particular, uh, what did I do? Well, this giant thing in the front, where I, first I just want to have all the invalids, right? So all the valid signals from our inputs, right? So we had to declare a wire of vec, and then we iterated through all the ports, and then we assigned, connected all these wires, right? But if, if all we want is just a sequence of these things, uh, we can do that, you know, much more directly. We can just map over the IO's requests, and then for each of those requests, we say, hey, give me um, the dot valid, right? And so here's a very natural use of that uh, placeholder syntax. Otherwise, I probably need to write, you know, p like uh, this, which is totally fine, uh, but I argue this is you know more verbose and less clear than just saying, "Hey, we want whatever things you're giving me, give me the dot valid field." Cool. Okay. 
we'll come to uh, actually I'll leave it like this first. This is how we had it on Monday. And we'll come to that field at later, but let's talk about the other fields. So if we go back a slide, uh, then what do we need to do? We need to do we need to set a default value for our readies originally. Uh, we also needed to build up this vec of bits. Um, and then we went through all this rigmarole of, you know, using a priority encoder and then outputting things. So let's go back, look forward and see what happens. Okay, so for, um, remember about the priority encoder, we just need the invalids, right? So that's the same as before, right? If we go back a slide, uh, yeah, it's, you know, working on the invalids, great. But now for our output bits, right, we had to build up this mux one hot, uh, you know, feed in the chosen one hot, and then also feed in the bits, which we had to build up manually by, you know, having a vec of wire and connecting them all. Now over here, what do we do? Well, we take in the chosen one hot, but now rather than having to build up the entire vec, we're able to just do the same functional programming trip like we did before with the map, but actually in this case, we just plugged it straight in. We didn't even bother enabling the interve intermediate variable, right? We just said, hey, give me all of the uh, bits fields and let's make a collection of those, boom. Um, that's pretty concise. And then there's this last uh, bit, and we'll come back to the this back in a second about, okay, and somehow I need to set um, the uh, the output requests uh, ready fields, right? So how do we set the output requests, or sorry, I should say, it's an output from us, the arbiter, but it looks like it's coming on the input port. How do we set those ready fields? Well, what we did, this example here, uh, if we go back to the original, oops, sorry, if we go back to the prior page, uh, what do we have to do? Well, we set them all to false, and then we knew which one was selected. We went through the hassle of converting the one that's selected to a uint, and then we know the uint, we go ahead and you know assign that specific one true. So in this case, this particular design is taking advantage of last connect semantics, where we initially assign them all, connect them all to false, and then you know we conditionally overwrite one of them. And which one we're overwriting is kind of set by this, it's kind of a quite a bit of extra hardware here, right? Where here we are saying, here we have this one hot thing, now we're gonna make it not one hot, and then we're gonna go ahead and use that to index into something. Now, if you look at what we did in the next slide, it's kind of a much more parallel way of thinking about it. Uh, we took the request lines and the chosen one hot and zipped them together, remember we learned zip last time. And then for each of those, right, so it's not returning anything, we're just gonna do the pairings. We have the input and that chosen one hot bit, and well, for the input bit, you know, so we're gonna go ahead and say, hey, the input dot ready, we're gonna connect it to what? Well, not just if it's chosen, right? We also want to do this if our output's firing, right? So fine, so now we put them all together. And so we actually have had a nice kind of compact expression. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not super obvious what's going on here, but I would argue it's still probably pretty reasonable, hopefully clear. This might be a little untutored on day one, but if you kind of keep playing around with these functional things and make more sense. Um, Okay, uh, there's a concern about the audio. I'll maybe see a thumbs up from other people to make sure we're still getting a good broadcast. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and then let's talk about this uh, other thing here. So remember that uh, our um, arbiter has a single output port and that's an, a valid signal associated to kind of let people know this is a valid output or not. So we want that to be um, true if we're outputting something correctly. And the way our thing's working is, well, if at least one of our inputs is valid, then our outputs can be valid. So we kind of want to just kind of reduce uh, the contents of the input. So the solution we showed last time was, um, we're gonna go ahead and take these invalid signals as a sequence, turn that into a vec, turn that into a uint, and take advantage of the uint having this built-in feature called or reduction or reduce, or, or r as you can see here. Um, that was a lot of casting and stuff and kind of gross, right? So you can see the line below it here. Now we can use the functional programming and say, hey, uh, I have this collection of seek of bulls and I want to go ahead and reduce them. And I want to reduce them using the or operator. And here we can use that in you know, a nice placeholder syntax and hopefully that's, you know, a more clear way of seeing it. So if you kind of compare these two side by side, you know, this line is of course commented out. Uh, you know, we have essentially what, five line body here versus, you know, quite a bit longer here. Right, um, in particular, some of the things that's kind of nice about this new way of doing it, uh, in addition to not having to kind of, you know, declare things and assign things, 
also this one took advantage of you know last night's semantics where we kind of had connections made that we deliberately overrode later on right which uh is a totally valid way to design hardware but if we have a choice to avoid it i argue it's worth doing uh and the reason why is you know as your module gets bigger and as it gets longer you know the initial assignment versus the overwritings of it may get farther and farther apart and so that's kind of a nice thing for readability is if you can kind of singly assign a thing once and make it very clear to hey this is you, you worry about this variable this is where it is it makes it very clear as opposed to someone else who's trying to debug your code later on and is kind of looking at it and is wondering okay well i see it's connected to in four places and i okay so i know which line order that is and of course the last one it connects wins but if those other connections perhaps are inside when statements and you kind of ask yourself oh my gosh which of those whens i think is going to be triggered or not triggered it can quickly be hard to read right and so by having a single assignment, in this case, you're kind of doing that at the last segment of, you know, parallelism provided by the functional programming. Uh, it's very nice. It's kind of much more clear. Uh, also, this approach, you know, we kind of had this parallelism with these one hot signals, and we were kind of forced to collapse it down into, a, you know, a single encoded number versus with the using the functional programming, working these collections, it was kind of more natural for us to kind of keep it in that one hot state and actually end up, in the end, even saving us hardware. Um, and even when we, you know, had this, you know, thing here, we had kind of do all this casting. Really, we're just trying to do an OR reduction. Uh, and with that OR reduction, um, you can see that, you know, uh, that's perhaps uh, most clear as just a reduce. Uh, now, uh, if you're, you know, doing the arithmetic at home and wondering, wait a second, what does it mean to do an OR reduction? That means you have some number of bits coming in and you're taking the OR of all of them combined. So when is that going to be one or zero? Well, if any one of those bits is one, of course, the whole thing is one. So thus, uh, it's only going to be a zero if they're all zero. So in other words, perhaps an OR reduction, could I have, you know, uh, done some sort of, you know, comparison with a literal of all zeros? Yes, of course, right? Likewise, for an AND reduction, right, it's only going to be true if they're all one. Yes, you could, of course, compare to um, a number of all ones in literals, for example. But uh, these reductions are kind of still a very helpful thing to have. That's why they're built into uint. But we also, of course, can, even if it's not built into our seek a bool, we can see the functional programming to do it. Okay, a lot happened here. So maybe we'll pause for questions uh, on this thing. Okay, well, we can uh, keep going. So, uh, one thing that may come up is what happens if I want to reduce on zero elements? Um, that's a kind of a question, right? Because we, we showed you a second ago, okay, yeah, we're reducing. All right, uh, if I have two elements, I apply the operator and I get one element, and that's good, I'm done. If I have one element, well, I don't need to apply the operator, I can just use the element. But if I have zero elements, what's the return type? You know, what do I return? Um, or uh, what happens if I want to do a reduction like operation, but the result is not the same type as the input element type? Um, there will be times you want to do this quite frequently. So the answer is you need another operator. Uh, and that's going to be uh, fold left, right? So what we're going to do with fold left is we're going to give you an initial value and a binary operator. Now, it's similar but different than reduce, right? So reduce kind of took two elements in, um, and they're kind of treated equally, and it had took those two binary elements and produced them to create one new thing. Fold left take a function. However, it's going to work on kind of like a total so far, so to speak, some sort of, you know, accumulated thing so far from producing, uh, iterating over this collection, and then the current element, right? Uh, so actually, if you, you know, look deep, in, deep inside, uh, you could probably pretty cleverly actually implement reduce with fold left, right? Um, but as I said, the kind of key thing we're using fold left for in our case is there's a few things we're not like it for. One of them is the fact that we can have different types. And another thing we like about it is it's very deliberate about how we can go through it. Uh, reduce doesn't give us any guarantee about the order in which we're processing elements, while with fold left, we're saying, no, we want to do it in a certain order. So here we have a you know, tiny scala example. Uh, and so we give it that initial element in the first parens. And then in the second parenthesis block, we say, uh, we, oh, sorry, which is all of this, I should say, we give it that function, right? So now our function is still a binary function. We're operating on two things. We're operating on uh, the value so far and then the current element. And so here I'm being very explicit and say, hey, let's do a sum. And so in this case, we could have done this as a reduce, right? This could have been just like a reduce. We wouldn't even need to have done any of this stuff. I could maybe just write it out explicitly. Uh, you know, I could just say, hey, we could have done 
uh, you know, reduce. Why am I going through all this hassle? That would have been the same thing. Well, I see an example of maybe why it's a little different. Let's do what I, as they call it, max the hard way. So let's say we want to find the maximum of a list. And so what do we do? We're going to go ahead and define a function that takes in something so far and an element, right? So it's kind of like our binary function. We can go ahead and you know, plug that in here, no problem. We don't have to actually define our functional arguments in line. We can, you know, name them first. And as you can see, right, you know, if what we have is so big, if we have is bigger so far, then we keep that. Otherwise, we take the new thing. So it's kind of just our mainly doing max. So here we're doing max the hard way. You know, obviously there's a built-in max operator for both collections as well as elements, but we can still see the behavior, right? We're here we're using a fold left to kind of do this work for us. Um, that's kind of a good example of fold left. And we're going to see some examples in, in a minute, but this is kind of just showing the idea conceptually. Um, and so I believe the next slide is going to have the diet visualization. Yes. So when you hear fold left, you're probably wondering, oh, wait, does that mean there's a fold right? Yes. Yes, there is. So uh, why do language designers choose these terms left and right? Um, to kind of not get mixed up on your lefts and rights, it's important to kind of understand what they're referring to. And so I'm going to explain these orderings in like three different ways. And perhaps one of those ways will stick with you. Um, and if nothing else, perhaps you'll have a little bit of caution in the back of your mind running, oh wait, is this that time when I want fold left or is this that one time I want fold right? Turns out most of the time you're gonna be happiest with fold left, but there will be a handful of times where actually fold right might be better. Uh, so wh wh why, why the difference? Okay, so fold left is if you have your collection indexed from zero and the zero is on the left, fold left goes from left to right, right? So that's, uh, you know, in other words, it's from the left, right? Which is, for us architects, perhaps the opposite terminology we would expect, right? When, when an architect says something like shift left, that is shift towards the left. And to make matters more confusing, uh, when you talk about like an architecture course or digital design course, say shifting, usually we put the most significant bit, the highest bit on the left, right? <laughs> so we're shifting towards the higher indices versus here we're applying uh, away from the lower indices, right? So it's it's... It's a lot of inversions here to keep track of, right? So in the case of the functional programming names of these operations, uh, the way I think of it is fold left is applying an ascending order of index, right? So I have a collection that, you know, is zero index or whatever, or whatever the iterator is. Um, if I'm doing fold left, I'm going through it in order. If I'm doing fold right, it's kind of like I'm going through it backwards, right? That's kind of what you see here. So in both cases, you give it a binary operator. In both cases, you, you know, you apply the operator n times. Just a matter of who gets it first, right? So here you know, we're working on element one, we're working on element one with the result of applying this operator to element zero and the initial value, right? So you have the initial value that you can define and then you apply it to an element and you get a result and that result, oops, I guess not all these arrowheads preserved in this visualization. It should be an arrowhead from here to here, I'm sorry, as well as from here to here. I'll have to go and double check that. Um, and, uh, but yes, so it kind of carries over. But yeah, so, uh, like I said, most of them probably going to want fold left, but <laughs> uh, you, there's, there will be a handful of times you might want fold right. Um, so to help you navigate that uh, landscape, uh, here's that brief detour I promised. We're going to look at these function signatures in Scala. So these are screenshots from the uh, you know Scala Language API website. And say, so, hey, if you're looking up something like seek in this case, and you're like, hey, I want to know about how to do map, right? Well, as you learned before, map is defined as a method on seek, right? Now, technically it's inherited from some, you know, abstract class or something, but, uh, you know, when you think of map, it's not some built-in featured language. No, it's a method available on that collection, right? And so if we want to know, remind ourselves exactly what's happening, well, as you can see map here, uh, it's going to uh, take as an argument a function f, and here's that syntax we saw before, right? Argument list, arrow, result, uh, and that's what's taking this argument, this function f. But you can see after colon, of course, this is the type, and it's the type of a function that takes one thing and returns one thing. Um, and so the whole result of this thing is a sequence of type b, right? So we may have seen these square brackets a few places. These are how you indicate a parameterized type. Much of the time, you don't need to explicitly state them because the type inference engine is so good, it can figure it out. Uh, and so, of course, what MAP is saying is, you know, your collection originally had some type a, and now you apply the map operation to it and add us some type B. Now B could be the same as A, right? We were just doing examples previously with ints, right? And it was ints going in, ints going out. But they can be different. Uh, and there's an example here is, you know, fold left. 
right? Uh, so here for fold left, we take uh, in an operation. It takes in two arguments, right? It's so a binary operator. And then it returns one thing, right? And if we're saying how many fold left, we can have a return type that's different than our input type, right? So this originally was a sequence of, you know, type A, we parameterize on type B, and we can take an initial element, you know, in this case, to put Z for perhaps zero, what it is effectively, right? And our operator is gonna take in that, you know, amount so far, and then produce a new amount so far, right? So each invocation is gonna produce that. So if I go back a slide, you know, uh, this arrowhead's missing, I'm unfortunate that I got lost somehow in the transcription, but, you know, so you apply this function, you got a result, and then you apply the function again on the next element and you use the result from the last invocation, right? So uh, does that mean fold left or fold right is very sequential? Yes, yes it is. Uh, you're deliberately saying I want to do things in this kind of order. Um, cool. Um, and so the TA is already, I think, uh, previewing my next slide, but I'm gonna pause here before I go talk about multiple argument lists in just a second. But first are the questions on this so far. Okay, well, as the TA foreshadowed, uh, you may be wondering, wait a second, why does, you know, fold left take in two sets of parentheses? Uh, that's something called currying. So this is a, you know, uh, concept far beyond Scala, but, you know, it's available in Scala. And what it is, we can um, start and kind of encapsulate multiple functions, right? So we can have multiple argument lists to a function. And we've actually been doing this without even talking about it, right? You may remember, like, we did, like, seek.fill earlier, perhaps didn't blink an eye about why I said, you know, to, we said to, you know, do it like this, for example. Um, now, why has this come up? Well, in some cases, and most often when you're dealing with this, some class someone else already defined chose to take advantage of this functionality. But there may be a few times when you choose to use, use this yourself. And what let us do? Well, let's just do a partially uh, applied function. So, um, you know, here we're doing a simple function sum, which adds two numbers, single parameter list, pretty straightforward. But now what if we break that parameter list up? And instead of doing the sum of two numbers, what if I want to make a function that, you know, I can pre-code and partially apply, and that's when those arguments is bound always, and the second argument is the variable, right? So uh, maybe I'll go ahead and make this uh, like a proper function, and we'll uh, hide these for now. Oops. Uh, too many uh, hotkeys, right? So, uh, you know, I define some functions and hey, if I define, wait, what is F? F is a function from int to int. <coughs> okay, and so yeah, if I want to do like F of two, no problem, right? I, I've created this. What's interesting is basically I've created a function F, which, you know, I can see from the type signature here, Int goes in, int comes out, you know, we apply the single argument, we got the number three because I added one to it. Um, so in other words, we've made a function that created a function, right? Uh, and so that's kind of what we're doing here with this currying, right? So we're kind of partially applying this function. We made this more sophisticated function, and we chose in this case to, um, and it goes, you know, applies these ones first, right? So we applied this one first, and we made this new function bound to f, which was basically had this thing already one kind of predefined. Right, and so, uh, as we saw on the prior slide, like fold left, that's where that syntax comes from, where we have, you know, uh, this initial thing over here. Uh, and, uh, you know, there may be some times you wanna play with it, right? So for example, here, we didn't even bother naming it before, we just gave both arguments, totally fine. Uh, and another time we may choose to use this. And um, so we have a sequence and we're, you know, mapping uh, a function, remember, we, are, we apply map, we need a function takes one thing in, returns one thing. Well, you know, uh, plus x, if only one of its argument lists applied, still is a function takes in an int and produces an int. And that's why it's totally fine to do this, right? We can make this 10, you know, that works just fine. Um, this is kind of interesting, right? So this is currying. Uh, and so the reason why I'm covering right now in the lecture that says you've probably seen syntax like this before already, we have multiple argument lists. Uh, don't freak out. Um, but there may be times when you choose to do it yourself, right? You want to make a function where you can kind of like partially apply it in advance and then go with it. Uh, and then uh, the question is, what happens if I put the underscore here? This is probably going to work. Actually, it's not. 
so what, what what's happening? Um, the que the reason why this question was asked was implicitly asking why did I put the underscore here? This is a little wrinkle in the language. Uh, I'm not pleased about it. But basically what it is is if you have a partially applied function, the type inference engine isn't necessarily clear that doesn't necessarily know you mean to have a partially applied function. So this underscore is a way of saying, hey, I'm partially applying this function, recognize this as a function, and do it. I suspect if I took this off, but made this clear that this was something that took in an int and produced an int, it would still do the right thing. Yes, right? But if I didn't have that there, it's going to complain, right? And here it's even telling us, right? We need to make it that conversion clear by putting in that uh, little trailing underscore. Using this trailer underscore like I did here, you will need to do so rarely. Um, I've virtually never done in my career or had to do it very rarely. Uh, I just did it here for the example, but um, most times if you're gonna take advantage of currying, it'll work pretty naturally because the place you're gonna be applying it is going to expect, based on the context, it's gonna expect the function and it's gonna give the right information to the type inference engine and it's gonna do the right thing. Okay, yeah, we're definitely starting to get into the weeds here in the Scala, but it's helpful, right? We're kind of seeing what's going on. Um, so we talked about, you know, oh, there was a fold left, fold right. And you're probably wondering, wait a second, is there a reduce left? Is there a reduce right? Is there a fold without any sign directions? Yes, all six variants exist. <laughs> um, and so let's talk about what, what these mean, right? So. We kind of already have a sense of the difference between fold versus reduce. Reduce, uh, you know, you need to have at least one element and the return type needs to be the same as the element type originally. For fold, it's a little bit more general. We can have zero elements. We need to give it an initial element to do the collapsing with and the return element type can be different than the input element type. Um, that's kind of the big difference, right? So you see general, so you see that fold is more general, right? In terms of these directions, um, if we specify direction, fold left or fold right, we are, you know, making it very unambiguous to the compiler. It needs to evaluate these things in that order. And we'll make correct assumptions based on it being evaluated in that order. If we do not give it such a direction, the compiler is free to, um, do it in any order it likes. You need to have an associative operation. Uh, and so, uh, in practice, I find I get the most things, the, the majority of what I need to get done with just fold left or reduce. Those two, if you learn two things, or actually learn one thing, learn fold left. If you learn two things, learn fold left and reduce. That will um, be fine, right? And so often, reduce is great. It's just for more graceful behavior when there's zero elements, which you want to support in sometimes for your hardware design modules, or when you really want deliberate order and you want to specify that, use fold left. Of course, reduce left also gives you deliberate order, but you, know, you have to use choices. Um, Interestingly, if you need to do something from the right, which is the opposite order, uh, you could do a fold right or a reduce right, or you actually can just reverse the sequence, which in some cases, of course, if you're, depending on what data structure is using, how big your collections are, this may not be a algorithmically nice thing to do. Uh, but uh, in terms of code brevity, uh, this is totally fine. And often in hardware design, our collection sizes are pretty manageable, in which case, if you're a little bit bad, if you're algorithmics, it's okay, as long as it's kind of clear and gets the right answer. Um, and so, yeah, you have it. So you might be wondering, okay, well, why, if there's directions, why should I ever leave it unspecified? Uh, number one, it may not matter. It's kind of good to kind of convey that. Uh, number two, uh, not at all covered in this course, but Scala actually is pretty nice with these collections because you can describe your computations in these very uh, ways where you say, hey, it's, you know, it's a collection, perform this transformation to make a new collection of map or something. Um, if you think about it, it's kind of very implicitly par parallel, right? And so... There's actually a switch you can flip and you can just turn your collections from sequential collections into parallel collections. And all of a sudden your map operations are done in parallel, right? There's no need to make a parallel block and define threads. It just, it just happens, it works, right? You've already with the functional semantics, functional abstractions that are kind of already defined at parallel computation. And so for example, both reduce and fold, those without a pre uh, mandated uh, uh, evaluation order are amenable to parallel evaluation versus you know these directionalized ones aren't. But don't worry, of course we're not gonna use a, Paralyzed Scala. It's not typically used uh, in Chisel because normally we're worried about just getting the right answer and getting through it fast enough, and then we'll worry about the tools later on. Whew. 
Okay, so that's a, a primer about the thing we said. There's so many different flavors. Scala's got a zillion operations in each collection, but if you want to learn a couple, I would focus on reduce left and, sorry, uh, fold left and reduce. Pause if there's any questions for now. Okay, so let's uh, keep redoing things using these functions. So maybe remember uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about a function I called a reducer. And what did it do? Well, you gave it uh, n things and it added them up. And because we had, you know, such primitive tools available at the time, we, you know, used a for loop of a var and we simply, you know, kept adding things together. And you now reduce, of course, uh, you know, we can redo this uh, and it's going to work just fine. In this case, it's a nice use of reduce because the way this module is defined, we already kind of were expecting n to be greater than zero, so reduce works fine here. So we could, you could make, you know, this of one and it just passes through naturally. If you make this, you know, let's say four and not get too carried away, it's gonna do the appropriate uh, carries for us and stuff. And so this is pretty nice, right? This is, this is so simple that if you're using this in practice, you probably wouldn't even bother defining a module for this. You probably just put it in line when you need it, right? That's kind of point. Kind of this functionality available to us is very handy to kind of put things together. Um, okay, another module we're going to redo. You may remember when we had this uh, delay and cycles module, right? It was you know n registers put together in series, so that way we could delay something by n cycles. We told you this is you know perhaps referred to as you know shift register, or in the Chisel util libraries it's called a pipe. Uh, so before we had to use a helper function, we did it with a var and a for loop. Here we did it with a helper function. Uh, and once again, we can do this. Now, unlike the prior example, we do care about the order, right? In the prior example, we were saying, oh, well, addition is associative, so we can add up whatever order the compiler chooses. Here, the order matters, right? Because we want to make sure to kind of connect it in that sequence that's linear rather than some, you know, arbitrary tree or something. Um, so we're doing a fold left, right? So for our fold left, our initial condition our initial value is, you know, um, the io.in, right? And then what do we get? Well, we are going to, uh, you know, remember fold left takes in two arbits of binary, so it's things so far, and then um, the element, right? And so uh, in this case, uh, the element's not needed. It's kind of almost like a, a weird relic because I did uh, a range to get the right number of things. But that little wrinkle aside, uh, really what matters is we're kind of passing through um, so right now the zoom is cut out uh, so I'm going to pause for a second while I try to get the zoom restored so yes you of you are getting the recording and getting a little bit of a more accurate play, but the zoom just cut out. So I'm trying to restart the zoom. So yes, the zoom cut out. Um, but I think that may have been on my end the network issue. I'm gonna go ahead and reshare and hopefully uh, if the recording works as well as me, the recording seems to be so good so far. Take me a moment to kind of reestablish everything. I hope I don't have a housemate uh, completely uh, sucking up all the bandwidth right now. They should know what time I'm lecturing. Um, okay, well, I believe we have the pieces in place, right? I have uh, the Zoom running, should be screen sharing, uh, still recording. Oh, people did lose power in Santa Cruz. Oh my, I didn't realize that was happening. <laughs> Maybe that's why there's so few questions. Um, okay, uh, well, let's try our best, and if not, this recording will be available. Uh, okay, so uh, here we are um, going forward with this, right? So we were talking about the fold left. In this case, it was really important to kind of connect things across. So we're using that regnext functionality. So the result of regnext, right, is going to be the output register, which fold left is going to then offer to the next indication of that function, right? So we're kind of passing through it. So just because we're using a fold or even a reduce, there's no requirement that we somehow be like adding things together or creating a bigger collection. We can just be using it to kind of track the last thing, right? So here we use fold left to kind of just iterate through things in a way where we kind of were statefully remembering the last thing we touched, right? 
This is, this is not an uncommon pattern a way to use fold left uh, for hardware design. But you know, if you're looking at this from a pure line count point of view, yes, you know, we turn four lines of a helper function into one. Uh, perhaps the for loop which, version, which I didn't copy over, which was a var declaration, then a for loop doing the same kind of last connect stuff. That maybe also could have been more clear. Uh, okay, so let's, you know, as I said, you're probably not surprised by the output. We can see, of course, the two registers are here. Let's keep going if there's no questions. Um, so one helpful tool will be this thing called zip with index, right? Because so far we kind of been taking in collections and we take collections and kind of treat each element, you know, individually and we kind of lose sight of where it came from. Sometimes you really want to know what that index is, especially if you have one collection and you want to kind of perhaps end access another collection, right? Uh, so we talked about zip last time, where zip takes two collections and, you know, it element by element pairs them up together. Zip with index is a, you know, extension on that, which automatically uh, pairs up your collection with indices that correspond to, to, to where they are, right? So rather than having to go zip with a range and manually do this, you just do zip with index and you get the same thing, right? So perhaps I'd make that extra clear, right? I could say, hey, I could say, hey, zip, you know, with, you know, uh, zero until uh, L dot size, right? And so you can see in both cases, we get the same thing. Uh, but zip of index is kind of a nice shortcut available to us. Um, and, you know, well, what can we do with it? Well, remember when we get, after we've done zip of index, we now have a collection of tuples. And so to access those tuples, we have a few choices, right? So here we chose to uh, bind them to variables and we can go ahead and multiply them. Alternatively, uh, maybe I'll go ahead and make another one of these. We could have said, hey, uh, let's leave it as a tuple. It left tuple t, and then I'm going to go ahead and, you know, say, hey, t uh, dot, and then uh, zero underscore one, t dot underscore two. Remember, tuples are one index, not zero index. Um, and so, yeah, it's the same thing. Uh, I think this is kind of more clear of a chance to kind of rename things. The only trick or caveat is when you're using tuples in this kind of situation, in order to get this binding to work out, you need to kind of give a scholar a little nudge. In this case, that case keyword tells it to start doing the pattern matching. And we'll cover pattern matching on Friday. Uh, that case keyword is kind of like a little nudge saying, hey, go ahead and do this. I'm sure you ever see what happens if I don't do that. You say, hey, uh, it doesn't really know what's going on. Uh, this is supposed to be a thing that takes in one argument. It's a map. When you give it this, it thinks this is a two argument list, right? And so you'd kind of tell it case, no, 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 I'm trying to uh, pattern match. This is a tuple I'm trying to, you know, uh, assign its, uh, you know, members to these variables. And that's what it's doing. So zip of index is gonna be helpful for us if we wanna kind of keep track of where things were when we kind of do these things. Cool, uh, questions on this. Okay, so maybe we can go start on tweaking more things. So remember, we built our own one-hot priority coder last week. Uh, we did it multiple ways. One of the ways we did it was with muxes, right? Uh, and remember we had this like, kind of this big cascading chain of muxes. And um, what happens? Uh, well, this big cascading chain of muxes, uh, we did it with like a helper function recursively and it worked out just fine. We'll go ahead and uh, uncomment that and we'll just run it. And you know, uh, Oops, I'm gonna take a one minus so we can see the stuff better. Uh, yeah, and you know, we get the right answers. Here we're trying to see what's the priority of these things. You know, um, the zero case is kind of a special case, but you know, uh, the upper bit only wins when the lower bit's zero. If the lower bit's one, it's gonna win, right? That's the priority encoding. We're just saying the least significant bits in terms of lower indices are actually gonna win in this case. So now when I redid it with the FP style, what did I do? Well. Let's talk through this. And there's actually a bug in here and we're gonna fix it together. So um, we took our input, which originally is a uint, but we actually want this to be a collection. We wanna kinda of treat each bit uh, separately. So uint has this as bools method, which takes a uint and turns into a sequence of bools. Okay, we're all on board together so far. And then what do I do? Well, then I'm gonna go ahead and zip with the index. So I'm gonna want the index later on. 
And then we do the fold left. What's our default case? Well, we said this zero case is kind of degenerate, but we'll have, let's say it's zero, we'll do the same thing, behave the same as the other one. And so then what are we doing with our uh, thing here? Okay, we're gonna go ahead and use that case to match against all these things. So it's a little bit complicated here. Let's kind of see what it's pattern matching against for a second. Okay, so we had the so far, yeah. And then what's the element type? Well, we did zip with index, right? So the element type now is a tuple, which is the original element, the original bit, and the index we zipped with it, right? So we can put together this kind of this complex construction, which is actually kind of surprising this all works out, but with the pattern matching it does. Um, so we're saying, hey, you know, uh, fold left needs a two argument method, you know, argument one, argument two, but rather than working with a tuple, I don't like working with, you know, underscore one, underscore two. I chose to name these things by replacing this with some names and using case to pattern match against it. Um, and what do we do? Well, uh, here's our function. So then we're giving these things, we return to mux. And we're going to go ahead and, uh, you know, return the right bit for that priority encoding as well as so far. Okay, so that's, you know, syntactically correct. If we run this, we're going to get the wrong answer. Uh-oh, uh, you know, this one we said, this one should have presence over that one. So it should be zero one here. So that's something wrong. So is there an idea what's going on there or what's, what's the mistake? So the, the issue is uh, we used fold left correctly, but we might have been asking to do the wrong thing. Uh, building with a long cascading chain of muxes is what we wanted. That's what we did. But if you think about the cascading chain of muxes, you got to think of who takes precedence over who. Uh, the answer is uh, the mux for bit zero was first, right? We did fold left. So we started from zero and then uh, it became so far and now it's passed on to the bit for mux one and now it's passed on to the mux for bit two, et cetera. Um, so as a result, we've actually kind of made this the lowest priority, right? So uh, one easy solution would be like, oh shoot, I probably should have reversed these. And yeah, that's gonna fix it for us. Cool. Uh, and then of course the other way of solving this um, is the thing we told about, talked about earlier, is like that one time you want fold right. Now I want to demonstrate this because you're going to see this error message and you're not going to know what it is, but I want to expose you to it. So wait, it just blew up, right? It shouldn't they be able to plug in fold right? Um, not quite. So in all of their cuteness in Scala, they flip the order of the arguments to the thing in the fold right. So for the, the binary operation in fold right, now the thing that's so far is on the right because here's fold right. So I have to do it uh, like so. And then it should be happy. And we get the right answer, right? And if you think about what's happening here, when we're saying fold right, really, you know, we're starting with the highest index and going down, right? But for this particular priority encoder where we decided that we wanted a bit zero to have the highest precedence, we want that mux to be last, right? We want that mux, if it's chosen a certain way to, you know, completely overpower everything else. So that needs to be the last mux. So either we could have done our dot reverse or a fold right. So now we've kind of seen both ways. Uh, I always find it a little weird dealing with fold right. So I'll probably would have done a fold left with the reverse. As long as this isn't super big, the reverse is not going to uh, kill us. Uh, oops. Uh, and better yet, uh, I don't believe the reverse is going to cost us any extra hardware. Uh, it's not, there's still two muxes there. Uh, and if I made this uh, bigger, I'm still pretty sure we're not gonna see like something weird going on. Yeah, there's no bit reversing actually happening. It's just the way it's evaluated inside the Scala. Whew. Okay, uh, questions? So the question from chat was, could I have done this with just fold rather than fold up to fold right? Um, I'm not going to say no, because I, I, I can't imagine every possible outcome, but uh, I, I'm not sure it's that easy to do, because in this case, 
we really want that deliberate ordering for precedence, right? We really want to have things kind of take control over each other. And so if the evaluation of the folding is um, not quite the same, how can I make that happen? You might be able to do that with like a equalities test. You might be able to. You might be able to have a different kind of muxes where you don't care about the order in which they're cascaded. This particular uh, topology we're designing, the way we kind of did the origin for even our recursive helper function, we had a very particular topology we wanted, in which case we kind of got forced into having either a deliberate fold direction chosen, but I think if we had a more arbitrary fold application, you know, order, it might be possible. But yeah, I'm not sure what is right away, but I'm not going to say it's impossible. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a quite, yeah, the advice is definitely to use fold left uh, unless you are really sure you want to make it ambiguous. Uh, reduce, um, the reason why I kind of let myself get away with reduce rather than reduce left, usually the places where I use reduce, it's a very associative operator and we just kind of want to kind of collapse it down. Um, but I mean, there as well, we could also argue we should be using reduce left or something. Yeah, once again, Scala gives us a lot of rope here. We have, you know, six different choices to choose from between, you know, reduce, reduce left, reduce right, fold, fold left, fold right. Uh, like I said, in practice, I mostly use fold left or reduce. But yeah, these are, these are great questions. Um, okay, so in the last demo, we're going to redo the crossbar we did last week. So remember, I told you it was a kind of a deliberate bug to make the kind of code simpler last time. If you actually looked at the uploaded slides, I put the full thing in there uh, to actually um, show you the quote unquote correct uh, way. So uh, remind yourselves what this crossbar is, right? It's some device that has some number of ports, uh, some number of inputs, some number of outports, and um, people could try and send a message if their type we're sending, right? Which has an address, which is a port number, and there's some data payload. And so, you know, a single message, you know, we, we can see the, the find here. You know, our entire crossbar had this I.O. We had some more inputs, some more outputs, and the message size. And, of course, we had a VEC coming in of messages and a VEC going out of messages. And they're both decoupled, right? So for input decoupled, it's a flip decoupled. For an output decoupled, it's just decoupled. Uh, okay, so, yeah, we can go ahead and redefine that. Let's see what we're working with. So uh, maybe I'll first uh, invert these. And so I'll leave it with the for loops we had from previously. Uh, and so let's talk about what this is doing, right? So we are saying for every output port, we're gonna have an arbiter, which is choosing which input port connects to the output port. And then we had all this work, right? Where we wanted to, for all of our input ports, we need to kind of connect them up properly to the arbiters, right? Uh, we need to get the output from the arbiters about which ready is selected back to the inputs. And we also needed to let input know at one, right? It could be the case that if multiple input ports request the same output port, that, um, you know, one of those input ports is not going to be allowed to transmit because the port it didn't win the precedence ordering for that port. And that's why that ready, that back pressure signal needs to be propagated back out. And so uh, an input port could be connected to many ports, right? Output ports. And so which of those are ones? We're kind of taking the or reduction across them. That's what we did here. Uh, and then for the output ports, what do we do? Well, for every output port, we connect the arbiter to the output, sure. But then we also need to connect all of the inputs to all the inputs to the arbiter for each output, right? So there's, there's this nested loop here, right? Remember from the diagram from last time, it's kind of a lot of wires. Um, so let's go ahead and we can go ahead and find this, sure. Uh, it still works. Let's go ahead and uh, start swapping things out, right? So uh, we had these two nested loops and I said, you know what? Uh, we could swap this entire in, inner loop with just this, right? So it's still a for loop, but the inner loop, rather than being a second loop, we did a functional programming, right? So what are we doing? Well, here we are taking all of the arbiters, um, and then we are using this map to go in and grab a certain field out of them, and then we're taking the or reduction. So it's kind of a nice compound expression here. Uh, one thing to note is that, you know, even though we're doing the functional programming stuff, we're still using the indexing from the, you know, outer for loop here, right? And that kind of actually was very helpful here because not only was there an issue of iterating across here, which the for loop is doing, but even per arbiter, we want to grab a numbered uh, thing, right? 
And so it's kind of helpful to have that IP still handy to us. So yeah, here we turned in four lines into uh, one. That's pretty cool, right? We you know, had to build all wires and then we connected all the wires and then we reduced the wires. Here we just are collecting the wires here and then we reduce the wires. So that's, that's a pretty nice application, I would argue. Uh, let's try this next one. So this next one, what were we doing? We were connecting, uh, remember for every combination, right? For every output port, that's the outer loop. And then the inner loop was connecting every input to the input of that arbiter associated with the output port, right? So for the arbiter associated with that output port, we're going through all of its input ports and connecting them up to the overall input ports. And then we're also connecting uh, the stuff uh, in order to see if it's valid or not. Okay. Um, so uh, a lot of work. Uh, so how do we know it's valid? Well, the valid here was not only is that input port sending a valid thing in, it's also that thing coming in from an input port is destined for this output port. That's kind of what we're checking, right? Okay, so that's that work here. Um, so how do I swap this to a more functional style? And then of course, we also connect the whole thing to the output port, right? Okay, so how do I do this in a more functional style? Well, we can see that below. Let's go ahead and comment that out. So what do I say? Well. In this case, I chose to zip it, right? You kind of see there's kind of two things working in tandem here. There's the input port of that field of the arbiter, as well as the input port uh, in general, right? So what I do, well, I took the arbiter's input ports and I zipped those with the input ports of the entire module. So now I've got a, a, a you know a sequence of pairs of those ports. And no, we're not gonna return anything. So we're using a for each here. So we have the arbiter input and the IO input and then we basically do the body of what's here, right? And so we kind of apply it here. So every you know what was before arbs op, you know, now becomes arb in, because that's kind of what uh, got mapped in. Well, sorry, it, it what was arbs op io dot in, right? You know, it's all kind of mapped over. So this worked out. Now, once again, we had a case where having access to this uh, loop variable was very helpful or very necessary, right? In this case, we wanted to compare against it. So having this outer loop being a for loop wasn't the worst thing for us. Um, and, uh, you know, I still argue that, you know, even though it may not be a huge home run for the second one, it's maybe a little better. I think for this first loop, it's definitely a huge improvement in terms of readability, maintainability, uh, what we did here. So cool. Okay. Um, we've applied some malfunctional programming, got some amount of simplification. That's pretty cool. But, you know, we still have four loops. So the question is, can we take this a step further? Uh, we can. <laughs> But we'll, I'm going to maybe argue we shouldn't, but let's go ahead and do that. So before, remember, we kind of collapsed this down to, oh, yeah, it was just a symbol for loop uh, across that stuff. Well, remember, we needed that IP field to know how to access the right port within the arbiter. So um, in order to kind of get that to happen again, easy to do that was zip with index. Okay, so now we zipped with index. And yeah, we have our input port and that index, and you know, this is basically the same as above, right? So yeah, this is, you know, perhaps line count and complexity wise comparable. I think this is a little bit, you know, obtuse of getting to the point. I think this is, you know, arguably more readable. So I think in this case, I would argue this is perhaps a overkill or excessive use of functional programming. Um, now let's look at the second one. So the second one, same thing where, you know, we, uh, this is the prior slide condensed down to the loop we saw we actually had some places where we wanted to use that OP like actually in the computation here. Yes, this can be handled fine functional operation. We can, we can handle that, no problem. But uh, within the meat of it, uh, it was nice to have access to that. So once again, same thing. We're going to zip the things up we need. We're zipping up you know, uh, the output ports with the arbiters, which we were gonna do, okay. We need that output port, and we need that index, right? So we have this whole long thing of, you know, Okay, well, here's the two ports, and then here's the index, and then we go through them and we connect things up. So I don't think there's a huge win here. Uh, this is kind of confusing. Uh, and this kind of show we can really go after everything. You know, before we had this output printf, we can do this just as well with a, you know, for each uh, like we just did right here. Um, so this is getting uh, arguably pretty dense, right? And so uh, that's kind of what I want to uh, encourage you with this. Oh, sorry. And then, of course, we can run a test if we wanted to. Uh, we don't need to today. But uh, I, I do want you to kind of leave with this thought in your head about, and this is something not just for functional, but in general, is, you know, 
there's multiple ways to write something. What's a good way for me to write it, right? Well, in terms of considering readability, considering maintainability. As a performance person, I love to think about performance always, but we can kind of delegate that a little bit later sometimes, right? And so if we use these functional features as well, what do we do, right? Well, we have shorter, simpler, easier to maintain code. That's the goal. Um, and uh, that's nice. Once it happens most gracefully, most elegantly, it happens most gracefully, most elegantly when the functional pattern uh, no, encoded by the operator, something like map or for each, and that's a good match to what you're trying to use a loop for, those might work out pretty well. As we saw in that last example, we had a nested loop, and your loop being turned into functional maybe was better, but I would argue doing the two loops, that was starting to get a little, a little gross. Um, it can be harder to understand. It can be more brittle. As the TA points out in the chat, uh, when it comes to debugging things, uh, if you have this long compound expression or deep things, it's hard to see intermediate values, right? So if you want to print things out and see what's going on, <laughs> it can be harder. So sometimes this was happening. So uh, what do I want you to kind of consider when you're doing this kind of stuff? Ask yourself, would a simple for loop uh, be more clear or recursion? I'm sure many of you perhaps are happiest with a for loop in var. If you can get away from var, that would be preferable. Uh, remember, var is going to help take away some ability to kind of catch errors by overly assigning immutable things. We would love to get away from var. But even a for loop without var, actually it's pretty clear sometimes. Uh, you know, or maybe recursion is a good way to break things up. Um, if you are going to use this stuff, kind of cap yourself to two or three operations per line. You can very easily kind of chain together really complicated big things. Two or three at most, right? You kind of saw, okay, maybe we'll do a zip and like a map and maybe a reduce. That's like kind of like the max, maybe just a zip and a map. Um, and also we saw in that last line, part of what made it so confusing is we had multiple lines in those function literals. When you start having multiple line anonymous functions, you can do that, but maybe it's worth naming the function properly and then calling it. You can totally call a named function for a for each or a map or something. Um, so yeah, so we're encouraging a little bit of hesitation. I encourage you this week to try to push it when you're doing assignments for this week, when we're doing like the labs and the homeworks to try and see if you can get used to learning the style uh, and kind of play with things. But as you're kind of going forward in the future, definitely think about a little bit of judiciousness and carefulness about uh, when it might be most appropriate. Okay. Uh, any closing questions? Okay. Well, have a good one, folks.